Hi, we continue in Genesis 25 today, one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. Jacob in convincing his brother Esau to sell his birthright for a pot of lentils. But there's a lot going on in the story, the entire story of which you can see on the left side of the screen in those few words from 2529 to 34, you can see the whole thing. And yet so much is going on there. As I was noting with the previous scene where the narrator simply describes the birth and gives us a brief description of the adult Esau and Laban, I'm sorry, the adult Esau and Jacob, we see the incredible artistic skill of these authors. And I really want to underscore that as much as I can because in the face of some who would read the Bible Bible is a simplistic document not worthy of modern attention, or who love it so much that they don't bother to read it carefully and think it just means what it says in English, as we actually dive into the Hebrew and understand the cultural context out of which it came, of which there may be many possibilities, as you can see on the right side of the screen, we can come to really admire what brilliant artists the biblical authors were. So one of the questions we have to face here, because we see in verse 30, the narrator tells us, and the parens are of course provided, uh, they're not in the original, he was called Edom, which raises the question, as we see on the right side of the screen, of are we reading this story at the personal level of the immediate situation of Isaac and Rebekah's children, or at the national level with Jacob as Israel, as they'll be named later in the, in the story, not in this immediate story, but later in the Jacob cycle, and Esau as Edom, named right here. And we have to hold those intention as we go. Another aspect that's related to that, as you can also see on the right side of the screen, is the question of when these stories were written, which is to say, what was relevant to the original audience? Was it written back in the 8th century sometime when Edom and Aram were actually enemies of Israel and the question of the relationship was at issue, or at some later time, either in Babylonian exile or after that? And we can't really resolve that from now, but perhaps if you watch all the videos on this section, you'll have a, a clearer idea. Idea at the end of that. And that's also parallel, as we saw in the introductory video, to these various reading times. And I really want to highlight this one here in the 350s, the 450s of the Common Era, where the Jewish rabbinical Midrash saw Edom as a stand-in for Rome. And so that's one as well, although we're, of course, reading it from our time period here. We've also gone over the broad shape of the story, framing two sections with Jacob and Esau in the middle of the section with Jacob and Laban, and this broad chiasm from Michael Fishbane that we're seeing that covers the entire chapter. And as we enter into our scene here, we see, as you can see on the screen now, the chiasm that forms these uh, immediate verses of this scene. And chiasms work well. If you're not familiar with them, I'm showing them in all my uh, Radical Bible uh, series because the ancient authors used them so often as a way of framing a text when there was no punctuation and no apparatus like paragraph breaks and first line indents and capitalization and all the things that help us keep track. Uh, so a chiasm shows us where a story begins and ends, and it also shows us what's in the middle. And right in the middle of this chiasm is Esau saying, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me. So as we enter into the story, one of the things we need to do is enter into the cultural context in light of this story. We're going to see that birthright, uh, bakora, is very similar, uh, as we can see the word here, bakortheta, in that form, but bakora, with blessing that we'll see in chapter 27, um, um, Baraka, and all that happens is the middle consonants are reversed. So birthright, as I'm sure most people would understand, is the right of the firstborn, but to what exactly? And nothing in the text tells us that. Uh, we hear this birthright like we're supposed to know what it is, and authors seem to act like they know what it is, but they often act by interpreting it from some time other than the story world, which leads us to those questions of these Jacob's times. Which of these times is relevant for the audience to understand what the birthright is? And similarly, what would be relevant for the original audience, which could have been any one of these places to understand what a birthright is? Uh, and one of the things that's key here is the birthright is not something from God. It's just something in a cultural context. Although, in Deuteronomy 21, we do see an element of which it's from God, and that's worth going to to look at, because it's interesting, not because of the Jacob and Esau story, but because of the Jacob, Leah, and Rachel story. So let's look at that briefly and see how the writer is suggesting an intricate combination of stories here. So we see in Deuteronomy, if a man has two wives, like Jacob does with Leah and Rachel, one of them loved, like Rachel, and the other disliked, like Leah, and if both the loved and the disliked have borne him sons, which they do, the firstborn being the son of the one who is disliked, which it is, then on the day when he wills his possessions to his son, he is not permitted to treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the disliked who is the firstborn. He must acknowledge as firstborn the son of the one who is disliked, giving him a double portion of all that he has. 
Jesus. So that's that's the understanding that the first the birthright gives the firstborn a double portion. But as we'll see in the Joseph story, Joseph, um, who's the firstborn of Rachel, if not the firstborn of Jacob, as the uh, person in charge of Egypt, unknown to his brothers that he is Joseph, gives his younger brother, who's certainly not the firstborn of anybody, a double portion. And so we'll see how that's being played with way later in Genesis. But for now, uh, we're to understand at least that Jacob and Esau both understand this, that Esau, having been born just a few moments earlier, has a right to double, whether that's a double of all of Isaac's possessions, which we'll see in the next chapter, which as you can see on the screen begins right after this scene, will show us an Isaac who's very wealthy, like Abraham was, in flocks and various things. So wealthy that the local king wants him to leave because he's too much of a threat. So there certainly will be a lot of wealth to give as a birthright. But one of the questions that the story doesn't address as a premise, but we need to think about is, is it for sale? Um, what happens in this scene, as we see, and going back up to the beginning of our scene here, so we can just see our immediate scene, um, is that Jacob makes a proposal, sell me your birthright. Uh, and the text, at least the narrator, tells us that that's what Esau did. But what does that actually mean? Does it mean anything to Isaac? Uh, if, if When the time comes, which it never does in the story, um, anywhere in the book of Genesis, uh, that for Isaac to distribute his possessions to his sons, can Jacob say, wait a minute, I get a double portion because Esau sold me his birthright? And I'm sure Isaac could say at that time, I don't know what that means. The birthright's not for sale. So at one level, this whole transaction means absolutely nothing. Uh, and we'll see whether the blessing, the paternal blessing, blessing, as opposed to the divine blessing, is a similar thing, dividing a family over nothing at all. So that's some of the context we need to look at as we uh, enter into our story. So let's just put the chiasm up for the moment and we'll pay attention to some of the details. And as we'll see, we already know that it's lentil stew. I, I assume you know, sorry if that's a spoiler, um, because the story is well known, but it comes as a surprise twist in the story. So let's enter into this. And you see the chiasm there. And I note this from Westerman uh, below, only to highlight how much scholarship has changed. So he says, he sees this as originally a, quote, civilization myth about the shepherd who gained supremacy over the hunter, then applied to the brothers Esau and Jacob. Of course, one could also say a similar thing about Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. This, quote, unquote, Esau has nothing to do with the Esau of chapter 27. Further, in chapter 33, Esau is portrayed as another person from the Esau of chapter 25, 29 to 34. And then he goes on. But that uh, whole way of approach, which leads him to think there are different sources, uh, is challenged by more modern scholarship, which suggests that what we're seeing is Esau is a round character, that he's not just a static character and we see him acting differently. We have to assume that's a different source. We can assume, assume that one source uh, has portrayed round characters. Uh, so unlike Westerman, uh, we're going to read this as a whole. So once when Jacob was cooking a stew, and the word cooking a stew has a play that works in English like it does in Hebrew, because as Hugh White notes below, the word is never used elsewhere in the hippel form as it is here to mean cook. Rather, it means to act presumptuously or with willful forethought, giving examples from Deuteronomy. In Exodus 21:14, it refers to the act of presumption or premeditation behind a treacherous murder. The meaning seems to be similar to the colloquial expression in English, to cook up, in the sense of to scheme, though it is perhaps much stronger in its negative connotations. And that's the way the lexicon sees it too, uh, sees it as, as conjuring up uh, something suspicious. So while he's cooking up a plan, as well as cooking up a stew, the word for stew, nazid here, is only here and in this passage in Second Kings, uh, which is in the elijah Elisha cycle, but is not specifically relevant uh, to our passage here. So Esau coming in from the field, which is his territory, as we saw, notices the reverse of the story in 4.8 of Cain and Abel in a similar context where Cain, jealous of God receiving Abel's sacrifice but rejecting Cain's sacrifice, calls his brother out into the field where he kills him. So Esau comes in from his male gendered patriarchal space to the female gendered space of, of um Jacob, mama's space, and it says he was famished, but really Ayaf, only here in the next verse, means exhausted. It's not the matter of how hungry he is, it's a matter of how tired he is. 
And as my note below suggests, Esau's hunger is a function of the vicissitudes of the hunter-gatherer life, in contrast with the security of quote-unquote lentils. The insecurity of grain will come around to haunt Jacob when the famine strikes later in his life. And I'd like to suggest that's part of what's going on as well. That this is not just two brothers and the narrator is giving them two arbitrary ways of being. It's showing the tension that we saw back in chapter 4 between two ways of life. The immediate way, which is certainly anthropologically and historically the earlier way that humanity existed, which is by scavenging and gathering, um, taking, finding dead animals and fruits and nuts and berries and such things, versus the agricultural life, which is settled. And as we saw in Genesis 3, agriculture was the curse to which the man and the woman were sentenced, she to many childbirths and him to struggling with the earth for food. So Jacob is going to give Esau agricultural food, certainly lentils. We don't know anything about wild lentils out there in the field. Um, so he's giving agricultural food. We don't know who grew it. That's never stated here. Um, but Esau, having been in the field hunting, has obviously been unsuccessful, even though in chapter 27, his father Isaac will send him back out there to gather the game uh, that his father loves and the reason for him loving his son Esau. So he's exhausted and depleted and I'm sure upset with himself for having failed at his task. So that's the situation we hear of Esau as the scene begins. And Esau said to Jacob, in their first conversation we have here, and in chapter 27 they won't talk directly. In fact, we won't see them talk again till the very end of the book, way down uh, here when they return. Um, he says, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. And the Hebrew is much more guttural than this. This is much more of a sentence than it really is. Um, the word for eat here, only here in the Hebrew scripture, um, means otherwise to devour or swallow. Um, Robert Alter suggests a verb used for the feeding of animals, and he offers, let me cram my maw. Um, Sarna suggests gulp down. John uh, Anderson, out of his dissertation I mentioned a couple of videos ago on this section, notes the parallel with bait in the sense of that Jacob is offering this as bait to capture Esau, a concept which the hunter Esau would be familiar with. But eat some of that red stuff. What we have here in the Hebrew is min ha adam ha adam, uh, adom, not adam like uh, a, a human being, but adom, the, uh, the verb form of it, although visually it looks the same since the vowels are not part of the, the written part of the Hebrew. So it could be, uh, give me some of the man, or the man or the person, but we know it here as red, as a dome, because of the, the vowel. And it's perhaps, as Sarna suggests, and many others, an implicit, implicit play on dom for blood, suggesting he's thinking that this is either blood or a meaty substance here. But he never names what it is. He just names the color. He sees something red and wants it for I am exhausted. And the narrator adds, therefore he was called Edom. But literally he was called there, as if he's being renamed, as Jacob will be later renamed to Israel. But Jacob's being named to Israel is done by an angel or by Yahweh directly, and here is simply the narrator. Called there, suggesting perhaps that was his local nickname um, that he didn't have later. But we will see later, all the way to chapter 36, as I noted last video, that the narrator will say, tell us several times, simply, Esau is Edom. So he's called Edom here in the sense of a red place. Um, notice that Edom and Adom are the same except for the slight vowel difference. So here's the situation in which Jacob finds his brother and speaks to him for the first time. And as my note below suggests, in contrast, Jacob is calm, reflective, and opportunistic uh, and says, no, please. Uh, and says no please, in the, in the sense that Esau said please, but Jacob doesn't say please. Uh, Alter notes, he is a suitable bearer of the birthright. Historical destiny does not just happen, you have to know how to make it happen, how to keep your eye on the distant horizon of present events. And then further down we hear, as Jacob here takes advantage of his brother's hunger to gain an advantage over him, so will Joseph later. And then finally from this scene from White, and from this verse rather, the strategy that Jacob has used here upon Esau is a mirror image of that technique by which Esau himself related to his father, i.e. a plate of venison and a pot of lentils. The same strategy will be used by Rebekah against Isaac in the next scene in chapter 27. So Jacob's response is very calm here. First, or literally this day, sell me your birthright. Mikra here and again in the next verse, and we'll see it for the sale of Joseph in chapter 37. Um, sell me here, uh, emphatic position and, and the final thing for Hebrew. So sell your birthright to me. And here we have Bakora. Um, Note it was back there in chapter 4. It's he, uh, here in this scene. It'll be one more time in Genesis, once in Chronicles, and in the scene I pointed out in Deuteronomy. 
Um, Esau doesn't argue about what it is. Instead, he says, I'm about to die, or Hene Anoki Holeklamuth, look, I'm about to die. Is that really the case, or is this an example of the writer suggesting that Esau is not a good evaluator of the circumstances? We don't know how hungry he is and exhausted he is, but it's probably the kind of thing that we say we're starving when we mean we've missed lunch or something like that, that he's about to die. In other words, he has nothing on his mind except stuffing some of that red stuff into his face. And then so he responds literally, and why, why this? Not what use is a birthright to me, but why this? Recalling Rebecca's cry, why is this happening to me? Or what is my life in this situation? So like mother, like son, loved by the father and not by the mother. So notice he doesn't say, I will sell it. He simply notes, I have no use for it. So Jacob recognizes that the transaction is not yet complete. Anderson notes here the absence of the word Esau in this verse as part of the process of marginalizing him. Uh, and that assumes uh, an audience, uh, whether in the reading time or in the writing time, that sees Esau and Edom as the enemy. But we don't have to see it that way. We can simply see this is a characteristic of the young Esau, and we'll see him change his character as it goes, especially in the last chapters around the other end of the chiasm down here. So he says, swear to me first, using the, the word for swearing, shove, that we'll see a number of times, uh, both with God and with ordinary people. So he swore to him. Notice we don't hear it out loud and there's no particular words. It doesn't evoke Yahweh or Elohim or any sense of divine authority um, hinging the deal here and sold his birthright to Joseph. Um, and as one of them notes, the chiastic structure cements the deal. As Sarna notes below, it is highly significant that the text only mentions Esau's sale of the birthright, but does not state that Jacob bought it. The omission in the present story is another way of dissociating Jacob's eventual ascendancy from the means he adopted, which is to say that the, all the action is on Esau's part. Esau's doing the selling. It's not that Jacob's doing the buying. And notice the verb buy is never said here. It's simply Jacob telling Esau what to do, and Esau does it. And now at the end, we get the twist in the story. Jacob gave Esau bread, which we didn't know was there and he didn't ask for, and lentil stew. Lentil stew. And as my note uh, below from Wenham has, not a rich meaty stew, but the, let the word red back in verse 30 suggest it, but only a dish of lentils. With this last minute revelation, we should be stunned. However, it's not clear how much the mere red suggests a rich dish. It's, it, seems, it's, it seems that Esau is ready to eat whatever's in the pot, and red suggesting blood as I saw before. But as Sarna also adds, something really important here, the color of the lentil is yellowish red or light brown, as you can see here. On this occasion, Jacob either added something that gave the stew an exceptional red hue, or he made use of the Egyptian variety, which is red. But how would Jacob get Egyptian lentils here? It's possible, I suppose, but we don't know anything about that. Much more likely is Jacob the deceiver, who we'll see deceiving very openly in chapter 27, took the yellow lentils, put something red in them, knowing his brother the hunter would succumb to that and assume it was meat and uh, go for it. And that's exactly what happens. And then we see Esau respond simply with four verbs in a row. He ate, drank, rose, and left. Five verbs, rather. Eat, drank, rose, left, went on his way, as, as Spicer uh, quoted at Westerman Notes. And this is matched, as, as Sarna notes, in 33.4 by the five verbs describing the reunion. And then we have down here also from white, transgressive eating is a sign of the same desire-driven mode of subjectivity in this narrative that appeared in the story of the Garden of Eden. Of course, referring to the woman before she's named Eve, eating the fruit of the, the tree of life. And not, or sorry, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life, and not an apple. Um, so um, Esau, satisfied, doesn't reflect, unlike Jacob, just does this thing and leaves, doesn't even say thank you. And the narrator concludes that thus Esau despised his birthright. And as Leon Cass notes, in no other place in Genesis does the text itself pronounce judgment on the deeds of any character. Um, using the word despise here, only here in Genesis, once in Numbers, on, in the Pentateuch, and 43 times in the Hebrew Scripture, and as Wenham also notes, a, rare, a rarity of a moral commentary by the narrator. Um, as Alter suggests, Esau, the episode makes clear, is not spiritually fit to be the vehicle of divine election. 
And Malul notes, in addition, a word with a clear legal technical meaning to relinquish one's right or status, to terminate, abrogate, or even challenge one's legal relationships with other members of society. So in other words, it's not an emotional term, like he hates it, but he's formally legally giving it up. But again, we have to ask, is that relevant to the parents? We'll hear nothing more about it, but when they return to gather together, we'll see what the effects of the selling of the birthright are, and as we'll see in chapter 27, um, Jacob stealing the blessing from him with the help of his mother. But in chapter 26, as we see on the right side of the screen, we're going to see an interlude where we get a couple of Isaac stories. So we'll move into that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.